Hello, and welcome to Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner, where I read plays, poems, or whatever's currently striking my fancy at the moment. Today, we're going to be reading two one act plays by J.M. Singh, an Irish playwright who is a contemporary of W.B. Yeats. The first of these one act plays is called Riders to the Sea, which was written between 1900 and 1905. The players are Maria, an old woman, Bartley, her son, Kathleen, her daughter, and Nora, a younger daughter, with men and women as a chorus. The first production was in Dublin on the 25th of February, 1904. Maria was performed by Honor Lavelle, Bartley by W.G. Fay, Kathleen by Sarah Allgood, and Nora by Emma Vernon. Scene, an island off the west of Ireland. Cottage kitchen, with nets, oilskins, spinning wheels, some new boards standing by the wall, etc. Kathleen, a girl of about twenty, finishes kneading cake and puts it down in the pot oven by the fire, then wipes her hands and begins to spin at the wheel. Nora, a young girl, puts her head in at the door. Nora. Where is she? Kathleen. She's lying down, God help her, and maybe sleeping if she's able. Nora comes in softly and takes a bundle from under her shawl. Kathleen spinning the wheel rapidly. What is it you have? The young priest is after bringing them. It's a shirt and a plain stocking would have got of a drowned man in Donegal. Kathleen stops her wheel with a sudden movement and leans out to listen. We're to find out if it's Michael's they are. Sometime herself will be down looking by the sea. How would they be Michael's, Nora? How would he go the length of that way to the far north? The young priest says he's known the like of it. If it's Michael's they are, says he, he can tell herself he's got a clean burial by the grace of God. And if they're not his, let no one say a word about him, for she'll be getting her death, says he, with crying and lamenting. The door which Nora half closed behind her is blown open by a gust of wind. Kathleen looking out anxiously. Did you ask him would he stop Bartley going this day with the horses to the Galloway Fair? I won't stop him, says he, but let you not be afraid. Herself does be saying prayers half through the night, and the Almighty God won't leave her destitute, says he, with no son living. Is the sea bad by the white rocks, Nora? Middling bad, God help us. There's a great roaring in the west, and it's worse it'll be getting when the tides turn to the wind. She goes over to the table with the bundle. Shall I open it now? Maybe she'd wake on us and come in before we'd done. It's a long time will be, and the two of us crying. Nora goes to the inner door and listens. She's moving about on the bed. She'll be coming out in a minute. Give me the ladder, and I'll put it up in the turf loft, the way she won't know of them at all. And maybe when the tide turns, she'll be going down to see it would be floating from the east. They put the ladder against the gable of the chimney. Kathleen goes up a few steps and hides the bundle in the turf loft. Maria comes from the inner room. Maria, looking up at Kathleen and speaking querulously. Isn't it turf enough for you this day and evening? There's a cake baking in the fire for a short space, thrown down the turf, and Bartley will want it when the tide turns if he goes to Connemara. Nora picks up the turf and puts it round the pot oven. Maria, sitting down on a stool at the fire. He won't go this day with the wind rising from the south and west. He won't go this day, for the young priest will stop him, surely. He'll not stop him, mother, and I heard Eamon Simon and Stephen Feety and Colm Sean saying he would go. Where is he itself? He went down to see would there be another boat sailing in the week, and I'm thinking it won't be long till he's there now, for the tide's turning in the green head and the hookers tracking from the east. I hear someone passing the big stones. Nora, looking out. He's coming now. And he in a hurry. Bartley comes in and looks around the room, speaking sadly and quietly. Where's the bit of new rope Kathleen was bought in Connemara? Kathleen, coming down. Give it to him, Nora. It's on the nail by the whiteboards. I hung it up this morning, for the pig with the black feet was eating it. Nora, giving him the rope. Is that it, Bartley? You do right to leave that rope, Bartley, hanging by the boards. Bartley takes the rope. It will be wanton in this place, I'm telling you. If Michael is washed up tomorrow morning, or the next morning, or any morning in the week, for it's a deep grave, will make him by the grace of God. Bartley, beginning to work with the rope. I've no halter the way I can ride down on the mare, and I must go now quickly. This is the one boat gone for two weeks or beyond it, and the fair will be a good fair of horses, I heard them saying below. 
It's a hard thing they'll be saying below if the body is washed up and there's no man to make a coffin, and I have to give in a big price for the finest white boards you find in Connemara. She looks round at the boards. How would it be washed up? And we have to look in each day for nine days and a strong wind blowing a while back from the west and south. If it isn't found itself, that wind is raising the sea, and there was a star up against the moon it rising in the night. If it was a hundred horses, or a thousand horses you had itself, what is the price of a thousand horses against one son where there is one son only? Bartley looking at the halter to Kathleen. Let you go down each day and see the sheep aren't jumping in the rye, and if the jobber comes... He can sell the pig with the black feet, if there's a good price going. How would the like of her get a good price for a pig? Bartley to Kathleen. If the west wind holds with the last bit of the moon, let you and Nora get up a weed enough for another cock for the kelp. It's hard set will be from this day with no one in it but one man to work. It's hard set will be surely the day you're drowned with the rest. What way will I live in the girls with me, and I an old woman looking for the grave? Bartley lays down the halter, takes off his old coat, and puts on a newer one of the same flannel. Bartley to Nora. Is she coming to the pier? She's passing the green head and letting fall her sails. Bartley, getting his purse and tobacco. I've had half an hour to go down, and you'll see me coming again in two days, or in three days, or maybe in four days if the wind is bad. Maria, turning round to the fire, putting her shawl over her head. Isn't it a hard and cruel man won't hear a word from an old woman, and she holding him from the sea? It's the life of a young man to be going to sea, and who would listen to an old woman with one thing and she's saying it over? Bartley taking the halter. I must go on now quickly. I ride down the red mare and the grey pony will run behind me. The blessing of God on you. He goes out. Maria, crying out as he is in the doorway. He's gone now. God spare us and we'll not see him again. He's gone now when the black night is falling. I'll have no son left to me in the world. Kathleen, why wouldn't you give him your blessing as he looking round in the door? Isn't it sorrow enough in everyone in this house without your sending him out with an unlucky word behind him and a hard word in his ear? Maria takes up the tongs and begins draking the fire aimlessly without looking round. Nora, turning towards her. You're taking away the turf from the cake. Kathleen crying out. The son of God forgive us, Nora. We're after forgetting his bit of bread. She comes over to the fire. Nora. And it's destroyed. He'll be going till dark night, and he'll have to eat nothing since the sun went up. Kathleen turning the cake out of the oven. It's destroyed, he'll be, surely. There's no sense left in any person in the house where an old woman will be talking forever. Kathleen cutting off some of the bread and rolling it in a cloth to Maria. Let you go down now to the spring well and give him this and he passin'. You'll see him then, and the dark word will be broken, and you can say God speed you, the way he'll be easy in his mind. Maria taking the bread. Will I be in it as soon as himself? If you gone now quickly. Maria standing up unsteadily. It's hard set I am to walk. Kathleen looking at her anxiously. Give her the stick, Nora. And maybe she'll slip on the big stones. What stick? The stick Michael brought from Connemara. Maria taking a stick Nora gives her. In the big world, the old people do believe in things after them for their sons and children. But in this place... It is the young men do believe in things behind for them that do be old. She goes out slowly. Nora goes over to the ladder. Wait, Nora. Maybe she turned back quickly. She's that sorry God help her you wouldn't know the things she'd do. Is she gone round by the bush? Kathleen looking out. She's gone now. Throw it down quickly, for the Lord knows when she'll be out of it again. Nora getting the bundle from the loft. The young priest said he'd be passing tomorrow, and we might go down and speak with him below if it's Michael's day or Shirley. Kathleen taking the bundle from Nora. Did he say what way they were found? There were two men, says he, and they were rown with pontine before the cocks crowed, and the oar of one of them caught the body, and they passed in the black cliffs in the north. Kathleen trying to open the bundle. Give me a knife, Nora. The strings perished with the salt water, and there's a black knot on it you wouldn't loosen in a week. Nora giving her a knife. I've heard tell it was a long way to Donegal. Kathleen cutting the string. It is, Shirley. There was a man in here a while ago. The man sold us that knife, and he said if you set off walking from the rocks beyond, it would be in seven days you'd be in Donegal. And what time would a man take, and he floatin'? Kathleen opens the bundle and takes out a bit of a shirt and stocking. 
The Lord spare us, Nora. Isn't it a queer hard thing to say if it's his they are, surely? I'll get his shirt off the hook, that way we can put the one flannel on the other. She looks through some of the clothes hanging in the corner. It's not with him, Kathleen. Where will it be? I'm thinking Bartley put it on him in the morning, for his own shirt was heavy with the salt in it. Pointing to the corner. There's a bit of a sleeve was the same stuff. Give me that and it will do. Nora brings it over to her and they compare the flannel. It's the same stuff, Nora. But if it is itself, aren't there great rows of it in the shops of Galloway? And isn't it many another man may have a shirt of it as well as Michael himself? Nora, who has taken up the stocking and counted the stitches, crying out, It's Michael, Kathleen. It's Michael. God spare her soul. And what will herself say when she hears this story in Barley on the Sea? Kathleen, taking the stocking. It's a plain stocking. It's the second one on the third pair I knitted. I put up three more stitches and I dropped four of them. Kathleen counts the stitches. It's that number, isn't it? Ah, oh, Nora, isn't it a bitter thing to think of him floating that way, and no one to keen him up with the black hags that do be flying on the sea? Nora, swinging herself round and throwing out her arms on the clothes. And isn't it a pitiful thing when there is nothing left of a man who is a great rower and fisher, but a bit of an old shirt and plain stocking? Tenley is herself coming. Nora, I hear a little sound on the path. Nora looking out. She is Kathleen. She's coming up to the door. Put these things away before she'll come in. Maybe it's easier she'll be after giving her blessing to Bartley, and we won't let on we've heard anything the time he's on the sea. Nora, helping Kathleen to close the bundle. We'll put them here in the corner. They put them in a hole in the chimney corner. Kathleen goes back to the spinning wheel. Will she see it? I was crying, I was. Keep your back to the door. The way the light will not be on you. Nora sits down at the chimney corner, with her back to the door. Maria comes in very slowly, without looking at the girls, and goes over to her stool at the other side of the fire. The cloth with the bread is still in her hand. The girls look at each other, and Nora points to the bundle of bread. Kathleen, after spinning for a moment. You didn't give him his bit of bread? Maria begins to keen softly, without turning round. Did you see him writing down? Maria goes on keening. God forgive you. Isn't it a better thing to raise your voice and tell what you've seen than to be making a lamentation for a thing that's done? Did you see Bartley I'm saying to you? My heart's broken from this day. Did you see Bartley? I've seen the fearfulest thing. Kathleen leaves her wheel and looks out. God forgive you. He's riding the mare now over the green head and the grey pony behind him. Maria starts so that her shawl falls from her head and shows her white-tossed hair. The grey pony behind him. Kathleen coming to the fire. What does it ails you at all? I've seen the fearfulest thing any person has seen. Since the day bride daughter seen a dead man with the child in his arms. What? Huh? Kathleen and Nora crouch down in front of the old woman at the fire. Tell us what it is you've seen. I went down to the spring well, and I stood there saying a prayer to myself. And Bartley came along, and he riding on the red mare with the grey pony behind him. She puts up her hands, as if to hide something from her eyes. The Son of God spare us, Nora! What is it you seen? I seen Michael himself. You did not, Mother. It wasn't Michael you seen. For his body is after being found in the far north and he's got a clean burial by the grace of God. I'm after seeing him this day, and he riding and galloping. Barley came first on the red mare, and I tried to say, God speed ye, but something choked the words in my throat. He went by quickly, and the blessing of God on ye, says he, and I could say nothing. I looked up then, and I was crying at a great pony. And there was Michael upon it, with flying clothes on him, and new shoes on his feet. Kathleen begins to keen. It's destroyed we are from this day. It's destroyed, surely. Didn't the young priest say the Almighty God won't leave her destitute with no son living? It's little the like of him knows of the sea. Bartley will be lost now. 
and let ye call an Eamon, and make me a good coffin out of the white boards, for I won't live after them. I've had a husband, and a husband's father, and six sons in this house. Six fine men. Though it was a hard birth, I had every one of them, and they coming into the world. And some of them were found, and some of them were not found. But they're gone now, the lot of them. They were Stephen and Sean were lost in the great wind, and found after in the Bay of Gregory, and in the Golden Mouth, and carried up the two of them on one plank, and in by that door. She pauses for a moment. The girls start as if they heard something coming through the door that is half open behind them. Did you hear that, Kathleen? Did you hear a noise in the northeast? There's someone crying out by the seashore. Maria continues without hearing them. There was Seamus and his father and his own father again who were lost in a dark night, and not a stick or sign was seen of them when the sun went up. There was Patch after I was drowned out of a keurig that turned over. I was sitting here with Bartley, and he a baby lying on my two knees, and I see two women and three women and four women coming in, and they crossing themselves, not saying a word. I looked out then, and there were men coming after them, and they holding the thing in half of a red sail, and water dripping out of it. It was a dry day in order, and leaving a track to the door. She pauses again with her head stretched out towards the door. It opens softly, and the old women begin to come in, crossing themselves on the threshold, and kneeling down in front of the stage, with red petticoats over their heads. Maria, half in a dream to Kathleen. Is it Patch? Or is it Michael? Michael is after being found in the far north, and when he is found there, how can he be here in this place? There does be a power of young men floating in the sea, and what way would they know if it was Michael they had, or another man like him, or when a man is nine days in sea, and the wind is blowing its heart set on his own mother would be to say what a man was in it? It's Michael, God spare him, for they're after sending us a bit of his clothes from the far north. She reaches out and hands Maria the clothes that belong to Michael. Maria stands up slowly and takes them in her hands. Nora looks out. They're carrying a thing among them, and there's water dripping out of it and leaving a track by the big stones. Kathleen in a whisper to the women who have come in. Is it Bartley it is? One of the women. It is Shirley. God rest his soul. Two younger women come in and pull out the table. The men carry in the body of Bartley, laid on a plank, with a bit of sail over it, and lay it on the table. Kathleen to the women as they are doing so. What way was he drowned? One of the women. The grey pony knocked him over into the sea, and he was washed out where there's a great surf on the white rocks. Maria has gone over and knelt down at the head of the table. The women are keening softly and swaying themselves with a slow movement. Kathleen and Nora kneel at the other end of the table. The men kneel near the door. They're all gone now. And there isn't anything more the sea can do to me. I have no call now to be crying up and praying when the wind breaks from the south. And you can hear a surface in the east. And the surf is in the west, making a great stir with the two noises, and they hitting one another. I'll have no call now to be going down and getting holy water in the dark nights after Samhain. And I won't care what way the sea is when the other woman will be keen and... To Nora. Give me the holy water, Nora. There's a small sup still in the dresser. Nora gives it to her. Maria drops Michael's clothes across Bartley's feet and sprinkles the holy water over him. It isn't that I haven't prayed for your body to the Almighty God. It isn't that I haven't said prayers in the dark night till you wouldn't know what I'd be saying. But it's a great rest I'll have now, and it's time, surely. It's a great rest I'll have now, and great sleeping in the long nights at the Samhain. And it's only a bit of wet flour we do have to eat. And maybe a fish that would be stinking. She kneels down again, crossing herself and saying prayers under her breath. 
Kathleen to an old man kneeling near her. Maybe herself and Eamon would make a coffin when the sun rises. We have fine white boards herself bought, God help her. Taking Michael would be found. And I have a new cake you can eat while you'll be working. The old man looking at the boards. Are there nails with them? There are not column. We didn't think of the nails. Another man. It's a great wonder she wouldn't think of the nails. And all the coffins she's seen made already. It's getting old she is. And broken. Maria stands up again very slowly and spreads out the pieces of Michael's clothes besides the body, sprinkling them with the last of the holy water. Nora, in a whisper to Kathleen. She's quiet now. And easy. But the day Michael was drowned, you could hear her crying out from this to the spring well. It's fond as she was of Michael. And would anyone have thought that? An old woman will soon be tired with anything she will do. And it isn't nine days herself as after crying, and keening, and making great sorrow in the house. Maria puts the empty cup mouth downwards on the table, and lays her hands together on Bartley's feet. They're all together this time, and the end has come. May the Almighty God have mercy on Bartley's soul, and on Michael's soul, and on the souls of Seamus and Patch, and Stephen and Sean, and may he have mercy on my soul, Nora, and on the soul of everyone left living in the world. She pauses, and the keen rises a little more loudly from the woman, then sinks away. Michael has a clean berry on the far north. By the grace of Almighty God, Bartley will have a fine coffin out of white parts, and a deep grave, surely. What more can we want than that? No man at all can be living forever. And we must be satisfied. She kneels down again and the curtain falls slowly. The End This next play is called The Shadow of the Glen and was written between 1902 and 1905. The persons are Dan Burke, farmer and herd, Nora Burke, his wife, Michael Dara, a young herd, and a tramp. Its first production was in Dublin on the 8th of October, 1903, Dan Burke being performed by George Roberts, Nora Burke by Marie Nicobla, Michael Dara by P.J. Kelly, and The Tramp by W.G. Fay. Scene the last cottage at the head of a long glen in County Wicklow. Cottage kitchen. Turf fire on the right. A bed near it against the wall with a body lying on it covered with a sheet. A door is at the other end of the room with a low table near it, and stools or wooden chairs. There are a couple of glasses on the table and a bottle of whiskey, as if for a wake, with two cups, a teapot, and a homemade cake. There is another small door near the bed. Nora Burke is moving about the room, settling a few things and lighting candles on the table, looking now and then at the bed with an uneasy look. Someone knocks softly at the door on the left. She takes up a stocking with money from the table and puts it in her pocket. Then she opens the door. Tramp, outside. Good evening to you, lady of the house. Nora. Good evening, kindly stranger. It's a wild night, God help you to be out in the rain fallen. It is, surely. And I walk into Britta's from the Ogham Fair. Is it walking on your feet, stranger? On my own two feet, lady of the house. And when I saw the lot below, I thought maybe if he'd a sup of new milk in a quiet, decent corner where a man could sleep. He looks in past her and sees the body on the bed. Lord have mercy on us all. It doesn't matter anyway, stranger. Coming out of the rain. Tramp coming in and slowly going towards the bed. Is it departed he is? It is, stranger. He's at a dying on me, God forgive him. And there I am now with a hundred sheep beyond the hills, and no turf drawn for the winter. 
Tramp, looking closely at the body. It's a queer look is on him for a man that's dead. <laughs> he was always queer, stranger. And I suppose them that's queer and they live in men will be queer bodies after. Isn't it a great wonder you're letting him lie there, and he not tidied or laid out itself? Nora, coming to the bed. I was a feared stranger, for he put a black curse on me this morning if I touch his body the time he'd die sudden, or that anyone touch it except his sister only, and it's ten miles away she lives, in the big glen over the hill. Tramp, looking at her and nodding slowly. It's a queer story he wouldn't let his own wife touch him, and he dying quiet in his bed. He was an old man, and an odd man, stranger. And it's always up on the hills he was, tinging thoughts in the dark mist. She pulls back a bit more of the sheet. Lay her hand on him now and tell me if it's cold he is, surely. <laughs> is it getting a curse on me? You'd be woman of the house. <laughs> I wouldn't lay my hand on him for the lawn on again and it filled with gold. <laughs> Nora, looking uneasily at the bed. Maybe cold will be no sign of death with the like of him. For he was always cold. Every day since I knew him. And every night, stranger. She covers up his face and comes away from the bed. But I'm thinking it's dead he is, surely. For he's complaining a while back of pain in his heart. And this morning, the time he was going off to Britis for three days or four, he was taken with a sharp turn. Then he went into his bed, and he was saying it was destroyed he was, the time the shadow was going up through the glen. And when the sun set on the bog beyond, he made a great leap, and let a great cry out of him and stiffen himself out the like of a dead sheep. Tramp crosses himself. God arrest his soul. Nora, pouring him out a glass of whiskey. Maybe that would do you better than the milk of the sweetest cow in County Wicklow. The almighty God reward you, and may it be to your good health. He drinks. Nora, giving him a pipe and tobacco from the table. I've no pipes save in his own stranger, but they're sweet pipes to smoke. Thank you kindly, lady of the house. Sit down now, stranger, and be taking your rest. Tramp, filling a pipe and looking about the room. I've walked a great way through the world, lady of the house, and seen great wonders. But I've never seen a wake till this day with fine spirits and good tobacco and the best of pipes and no one to taste them but the woman only. Didn't you hear me say it was only after dying on me he was when the sun went down? And how would I go out into the glen and tell the neighbours? And I, a lone woman with no house near me. Tramp, drinking. There's no offence, lady of the house. No offence in life, stranger. How would the like of you passing in the dark night know the lonesome way I was with no house near me at all? Tramp, sitting down. I knew rightly. He lights his pipe so that there is a sharp light beneath his haggard face. And I was thinking, and I coming in through the door, that as many a lone woman be afeard the like of me in the dark night, and a place wouldn't be as lonesome as this place, where there aren't two living souls would see the little light he have shining from the glass. I'm thinking many would be afeard. But I never knew what way I'd be afeard of beggar, or bishop, or any man of you at all. She looks towards the window and lowers her voice. It's other things than the like of you, stranger, that would make a person a feared. Tramp, looking round with a half-shudder. It is surely, God help us all. <laughs> Nora, looking at him for a moment with curiosity. You're saying that, stranger, as if you were easy afeared. It is myself, lady of the house, that does be walking around in the dark nights, and crossing the hills when the fog is on them. The time a little stick would seem as big as your arm and a rabbit as big as a bay horse, and a stack of turf as big as a towering church in the city of Dublin. <laughs> if myself was easy a fairer, I'm telling you, it's long ago I'd have been locked into the Richmond Asylum, or maybe have run up the back hills with nothing on me but an old shirt, and been eaten with the crows the like of Patch Darcy, the Lord have mercy on him in the air that's gone. You knew Darcy? Wasn't I the last one who heard his living voice in the whole world? There were great stories of what was heard at the time, but would anybody believe the things they do be saying in the glen? It was no lie, lady of the house. I was passing below on a dark night the like of this night, and the sheep were lying under the ditch, and every one of them coughing and choking, like an old man with a great rain in the fog. Then I heard a ting talking. Queer talk you wouldn't believe at all, and you out of your dreams, and merciful God, says I, if I begin hearing the like of that voice out of the thick mist, I'm destroyed, surely. 
Then I run, and I run, and I run till I was below in Ratavana. I got drunk that night. I got drunk in the morning and I drunk the day after. I was coming from the races beyond. And the third day they found Darcy. Then I knew it was himself I was after hearing. And I wasn't afraid anymore. God spare Darcy. He'd always look in here and he passing up or passing down. And it's very lonesome I was after him a long while. She looks over at the bed and lowers her voice, speaking very clearly. And then I got happy again. If it's ever happy we are, stranger. For I got used to being lonesome. A short pause. Then she stands up. Was there anyone on the last bit of the road, stranger, and you coming from Ogram? There was a young man with the drift of mountain ewes, and he running after them this way and that. Far down, stranger. A piece only. She fills the kettle and puts it on the fire. Maybe, if you're not easy afeard, he'd stay here a short while alone with himself. I would, surely. A man that's dead can do no hurt. I'm going a little back to the west, stranger. For himself would go there one night and another, and whistle at that place. And then the young man you're after seeing, a kind of farmer has come up from the sea to live in a cottage beyond, would walk round to see if there was a thing we'd have to be done. And I'm wanting him this night. The way he can go down into the glen when the sun goes up, and tell the people that himself is dead. Tramp, looking at the body in the sheet. It's myself I will go for him, lady of the house, and let you not be destroying yourself with the great rain. <laughs> you wouldn't find your way, stranger. For there's a small path only, and it's running up between two silly weeks where an ass and a cart will be drowned. She puts a shawl over her head. Let you be making yourself easy, and saying a prayer for a soul, and it's not so long I'll be coming again. Tramp, moving uneasily. Maybe if you had a piece of grey thread and a sharp needle, there's great safety in a needle lady of the house. I'd be putting a little stitch here and there in my old coat, the time I'd be praying for a soul and it going up naked to the saints of God. Nora takes a needle and thread from the front of her dress and gives it to him. There's the needle, stranger. And I'm thinking you won't be lonesome, and you're used to the back hills. For isn't a dead man itself more company than to be sitting alone, and hearing the winds crying, and you not knowing on what your thing your mind would stay? <laughs> it's true, surely. And the Lord have mercy on us all. Nora goes out. The tramp begins stitching one of the tags in his coat, saying the day profundus under his breath. In an instant the sheet is drawn slowly down, and Dan Burke looks out. The tramp moves uneasily, then looks up, and springs to his feet with a movement of terror. Dan, with a hoarse voice, Don't be afeard, stranger. A man that's dead can do no hurt. Tramp, trembling, I, I, I meant no harm, your honor. And won't you leave me easy to be saying a little prayer for your soul? A long whistle is heard outside. Dan, listening, sitting up in his bed and speaking fiercely. Ah, the devil mender. Do you hear that, stranger? Do you ever hear another woman make a whistle the like of that with two fingers in her mouth? He looks at the table hurriedly. I'm destroyed with the draught. Let you bring me a drop quickly before herself comes back. Tramp, doubtfully. Is not dead you are? How would I be dead? And I as dry as a baked bone, stranger. Tramp, pouring out the whiskey. What will herself say if she smells the stuff on you? For I'm thinking it's not nothing you're letting on being dead. It is not, stranger. But she won't be coming near me at all. And it's not long now I'll be letting on for I've been cramped in my back and my hips asleep on me and there's a devil's own fly at my own nose. Sneer dead I was wanting to sneeze. And you blathering about the rain and... Darcy. Devil choke him. And the towering church... Give me that whiskey. Will you have yourself come back before I taste a drop at all? Tramp gives him the glass and he drinks. Go over now to that cupboard and bring me a black stick you'll see in the west corner by the wall. Tramp, taking a stick from the cupboard. Is it that? It is, stranger. It's a long time I'm keeping that stick for I have a bad wife in the house. Tramp, with a queer look. Is it herself, master of the house? And she a grand woman to talk? It's herself, surely. It's a bad wife she is. A bad wife for an old man, and I'm getting old, God help me, though I've an arm to me still. He takes the stick in his hand. Let you wait now a short while. And it's a great sight you'll see in this room in two hours or three. He stops to listen. Is that somebody above? Tramp, listening. 
There's a voice speaking on the path. Put that stick here on the bed and smooth the sheets the way it was lying. He covers himself up hastily. Be falling asleep now, and don't let on you know anything, or I'll be having your life. I wouldn't have told you at all, but it's a story with the draught I was. Tramp, covering his head. Have no fear, master of the house. What is it I know the like of you and I be saying a word or putting out my hand to stay you at all? He goes back to the fire, sits down on a stool with his back to the bed, and goes on stitching his coat. Dan, under the sheets. Stranger. Whist, whist. Be quiet, I'm telling you. They're coming now at the door. Nora comes in with Michael Dara, a tall, innocent young man behind her. I wasn't long at all, stranger, for I met himself on the path. You were middling long, lady of the house. There was no sign from himself. No sign at all, lady of the house. Nora to Michael. Go over now and pull down the sheet, and look on himself, Michael Dara, and you'll see us the truth I'm telling you. I will not, Nora. I do be feared of the dead. He sits down on a stool next to the table facing the tramp. Nora puts the kettle on a lower hook of the pot hooks and piles turf under it. Nora, turning to the tramp. Will you drink a sup of tea with myself and the young man, stranger? Or, speaking more persuasively, will you go into the little room and stretch yourself out a short while on the bed? I'm taking a destroyed you are walking the length of that way in the great rain. Is it go away and leave you? And you have an awake lady of the house? I will not, surely. He takes a drink from his glass which he has besides him. And it's none of your tea I'm asking either. He goes on stitching. Nora makes the tea. Michael, after looking at the tramp rather scornfully for a moment. It's a porter coat you have, God help you. And I'm taking it's a poor tailor you are with it. Tramp looks up at him for a moment. If it's a poor tailor I am... I'm taking as a poor herd does be running back and forward after a little handful of yous the way I seen yourself running this day, young fella, and you coming from the fair. Nora comes back to the table, to Michael in a low voice. Let ye not mind him at all, my goddaughter. He has a drop taken, and it soon he'll be falling asleep. It's no lie he's telling. I was destroyed, surely. They were that willful they were, running off into one man's bit of oats, and another man's bit of hay, and tumbling into the red bogs till it's more like a pack of old goats than sheep they were. Mountain use is a queer breed, Nora Beck, and I'm not used to them at all. Nora, settling the tea things. There's no one can drive a mountain new but the men who do be reared in the Glen Malru, I've heard them say. And above by Ratvana, in the Glen I'm all, men that like a patched Darcy goat sparrow's soul who would walk through the five hundred sheep and miss one of them, and he not reckoning them at all. Michael, uneasily. Is it the man went queer in his head the year that's gone? It is, surely. Tramp, plaintively. I was a great fellow, young man. A great man, I'm telling you. There was never a lamb from his own use he wouldn't know before it was marked. And he'd run from this way to the city of Dublin and never catch for his breath. Nora, turning round quickly. He was a great man, surely, stranger. And isn't it a grand thing when you hear a living man saying a good word of a dead man, and he mad dying? It's the truth I'm saying, God spare his soul. He puts the needle under the collar of his coat and settles himself to sleep in the chimney corner. Nora sits down at the table. Their backs are turned to the bed. Michael, looking at her with a queer look. I heard tell this day, Norderberg, that it was on the path below Patch Darcy would be passing up and passing down. And I heard them say he never passed at night or morning without speaking with yourself. It was no lie you heard, Michael Dara. I'm thinking it's a power of men you're after. Knowing if it's in a lonesome place, you'll live itself. Nora, giving him his tea. It's in a lonesome place you do have to be talking with someone. And looking for someone in the evening of the day. And if it's a power of men I'm after, knowing they were fine men. For I was a hard child to please. And a hard girl to please. She looks at him a little more sternly. And it's a hard woman I am to please this day, Michael Dara. And it's no lie, I'm telling you. Michael looking over to see that the tramp is asleep, and then pointing to the dead man. Was it a hard woman to please you were when you took himself for your man? What way would I live an iron old woman if I didn't marry a man with a bit of farm, and cows on it, and sheep on the back hills? Michael, considering. That's true, Nora. 
maybe it's no fool you were, for there's good grazing on it if it is a lonesome place, and I'm taking it as a good sum he's left behind. Nora, taking the stocking with money from her pocket and putting it on the table. I do be thinking in the long nights it was a big fool I was at the time, Michael Dara. For what good is a bit of farm with cows on it, and sheep on the back hills when you do be sitting, looking out from the door the like of that door, and seeing nothing but the mists rolling down the bog, and the mists again and they rolling up the bog, and hearing nothing but the wind crying out and the bits of broken trees were left from the great storm, and the streams roaring with the rain. Michael, looking at her uneasily. What is it ails you this night, Neuerberg? I've heard it tell us the like of that talk you do hear from men, and they after being a great while on the back hills. It's a bad night, and a wild night, Michael Dara. And isn't it a great while I'm at the foot of the back hills, sitting up here boiling food for himself, and food for the brewed sow and baking a cake when the night falls? She puts up the money, listlessly, in little piles on the table. Isn't it a long while I'm sitting here in the winter, and the summer and the fine spring, and the young grown behind me in the old passing, saying to myself one time, to look on Mary Brine who wasn't that height, holding out her hand. And I a fine girl growing up, and there she is now with two children, and another coming on her in three months or four. She pauses. Michael, moving over three of the piles. That's three pounds we have now, Norbeck. And saying to myself another time, to look on Peggy Kavanagh, who had the lightest hand at milking a cow that wouldn't be easy, or turn in a cake. And there she is now, walking around on the roads, or sitting in a dirty old house with no teeth in her mouth and no sense, and no more hair than you see on a bit of hill after they burn in the furs from it. She pauses again. That's five pounds and ten notes. A good sum, surely. It's not that way you'll be talking when you marry a young man, Norberg. And they were saying in the fair my lambs were the best lambs, and I got a grand price, for I'm no fool now at making a bargain when my lambs are good. What was it you got? Twenty pound for the lot, Norbeck. We do right now to wait till himself be quiet a while in the seven churches, and then you'll marry me in the chapel of Ratvana, and I'll bring the sheep up on the bit of hill you have in the back mountain, and we won't have anything we'd be afeard to let our minds on when the mist is down. Nora, pouring him out some whiskey. Why would I marry you, Michael Dara? You'll be getting old, and I'll be getting old, and in a little while, I'm telling you, you'll be sitting up in your bed, the way himself was sitting, with a shake in your face and your teeth fallen and the white hair sticking out round you like an old bush where the sheep do be leaping a gap. Dan Burke sits up noiselessly from under the sheet with his hand to his face, his white hair sticking out round his head. Nora goes on slowly without hearing him. It's a pitiful thing to be getting old, but it's a queer thing, surely. It's a queer thing to see an old man sitting up there in his bed, with no teeth in him and a rough word in his mouth, and his chin the way it would take the bark from the edge of an oak board he'd have built in a door. God forgive me, Michael Dara. We'll all be getting old. But it's a queer thing, surely. It's too lonesome you are living a long time with an old man, Nora, and you're talking again like a herd that would be coming down from the thick mist. He puts his arm around her. But it's a fine life you'll have now with a young man. A fine life, surely. Dan sneezes violently. Michael tries to get to the door, but before he can do so, Dan jumps out of the bed in a queer white clothes with the stick in his hand and goes over and puts his back against it. The Son of God deliver us! Michael crosses himself and goes back across the room. Dan, holding up his hand at him, now you'll not marry her that I'm a rotten below in the seven churches, and you'll see the thing I'll give you will fall you to the back mountains when the wind is high. Michael to Nora. Get me out of it, Nora, for the love of God. He always did what you bid him, and I'm thinking he would do it now. Nora, looking at the tramp. Is he dead or is he living? Dan, turning towards her. It's little you care if it's dead or living I am. But there'll be an end now of your fine times and all the talk you have of young men and old men, and all the mist coming up or going down. He opens the door. You'll walk out now from that door, Norberg, and it's not tomorrow or the next day or any day of your life that you'll put your foot through it again. Tramp, standing up. It's a hard thing you're saying for an old man, master of the house. And what would the like of her do if you put her out on the roads? That to be walking around the like of Peggy Cavanaugh below and be begging money at the crossroads or selling songs to the men. 
Walk out now, Norberk, and it's soon you'll be getting old with that life, I'm telling you. It's soon your teeth'll be falling and your head'll be the like of a bush where the sheep do be leaping a gap. He pauses. She looks round at Michael. Michael, timidly. There's a fine union below in Rathrum. <laughs> the like of her will never go there. It's a lonesome road she'll be going, and hiding herself away till the end will come. And they find her stretched like a dead sheep with a frost on her, or the big spiders maybe, and they put their webs on her in the butt of a ditch. What way will yourself be that day, Daniel Burke? What way will you be the day when you're lying down a long while in your grave? For it's bad you are living, and it's bad you'll be when you're dead. She looks at him a moment fiercely, then half turns away and speaks plaintively again. Yet, if it is itself, Daniel Burke, who can help it at all, and let you be getting up into your bed, and not be taking your death with the wind blowing on you, and the rain with it, and half in your skin. It's proud and happy you'd be if I was getting my death the day I was shot of yourself, pointing to the door. Let you walk out through that door, I'm telling you, and let you not be passing this way if it's hungry you are, or wanting the bed. Tramp, pointing to Michael. Maybe himself would take her. What would he do with me now? Give you the half of a dry bread and good food in your mouth. Is it a fool you think I'm stranger? Or is it a fool you were born yourself? Let her walk out of that door and let you go along with her, stranger, if it's rain in itself or it's too much talk you have, surely. Tramp, going over to Nora. We'll be going now, lady of the house. The rain's fallen, but the air is kind. And maybe it'll be a grand one by the grace of God. What good is a grand morning when I'm destroyed, surely? And I going out to get my death walking the roads? You'll not be getting your death with myself, lady of the house, and I know in all the ways a man can put food in his mouth. I'll be going now, I'm telling you. In the time you'll be feeling the cold and the frost and the great rain and the sun again and the south wind blowing in the glens, you'll not be sitting up in a wet ditch the way you're after sitting in this place, making yourself old with looking at each day and it passing you by. You'll be saying one time, it's a grand evening by the grace of God, and another time, it's a wild night, God help us, but it'll pass, surely. You'll be saying, Get out of that door, I'm telling you, and do your blather and blow in the glen. Come along with me now, lady of the house. And it's not my blathering you'll be hearing only, but you'll be hearing the herons cry over the black lakes, and you'll be hearing the grouse and the owls with them, and the larks and the big thrushes when the days are warm. And it's not from the like of them that you'll be hearing the talk of getting old like Peggy Kavanagh, and losing the hair off you in the light of your eyes. And there'll be no old fellow who's in the like of a sick sheep close to your ear. I'm thinking as myself will be wheezing that time with lying down under the heavens when the night is cold. But you've a fine bit of talk, stranger. And it's with yourself I'll go. She goes toward the door and then turns to Dan. You think it's a grand thing you're after doing with your letting on to be dead. But what is it at all? What way would a woman live in a lonesome place the like of this place, and she not making talk with the men passing? And what way will yourself live from this day with none to carry you? What is it you'll have now but a black life, Daniel Burke? And it's not long I'm telling you till you'll be lying again under that sheet, and you dead, surely. She goes out with the tramp. Michael is slinking after them, but Dan stops him. Sit down now and take a little taste of the stuff, Michael Dara. There's a great draught on me, and the night is young. Michael, coming back to the table. And it's very dry, I am, surely. With the fear of death you put on me, and I have to drive in mountain use since the turn of the day. Dan, throwing away his stick. I was thinking to strike you, Michael Dara. But you're a quiet man, God help you. And I don't mind you at all. He pours out two glasses of whiskey and gives one to Michael. Your good health. Michael Dara. God reward you, Daniel Burke, and may you have a long life and a quiet life and good health with it. They drink. Curtain. And that is the end of this episode of Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner. I hope to read some more sing. I also hope to read some more poems if I get the chance. My life is a little hectic right now. I'm trying to move over to Ireland. So hopefully this Irish accent will continue to grow and become more realistic as time goes on. But until then, um, if you have any plays that you would like to suggest me to read, or any 
plays that you have written yourself that you would like to have read, just email me at bemuseartsinc at gmail.com. That's B-E-M-U-S-E-A-R-T-S-I-N-C at gmail.com. Thank you, and I hope to have you back in Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner.